So do you have any memory of your first irrational response to someone or something? I remember this incident from my childhood when I was around four years old. My cousin, who was my all-time playmate, came to visit me and coincidentally that day, she had got her head shaved off. I looked at her and started crying vigorously. She wanted to meet me, play with me, but I kept on crying. So she slid behind her mother so as to not bother me or maybe my screams could have terrified her. But I kept on crying until she left. Nowadays, when I see the absurdity of power, of hatred all around us, I'm suddenly reminded of this episode. What is it? Is it a fear of the unfamiliar that is so aggravating? Was it a primitive sense of territoriality in me that told me that this is my home, so I am the one who should stay and she has to leave? So we often grow up with a sense of security that comes through sameness. Curiosity is deemed dangerous. The unfamiliar is to be feared. Although I have lived in the same neighborhood, the same house, almost in the same room, for the first 24 years of my life, I descend from a family of refugees who were exiled from home and language. I knew of friendship from the story of a man from the other faith who helped my grandfather cross the border and later he was killed for that. I have seen my grandmother nurture life and empathy through very simple rituals of every day, like stitching, making tea, cooking, planting, though I knew that she is broken, wounded from inside. Moving over to 2016, I met Rosalie Purvis when I was working on a cross-border performance. Very quickly, Rosalie and I, we both realized that we have lived in two totally different continents, cultures, but we've lived parallel lives in our respective cities. For instance, we negotiate our role as women, as urban women in the academia and in performance, women as breadwinners and caregivers, women who descend from a family of refugees in my case, and Holocaust survivors in Rosalie. So we often call each other sisters by way of history or art. Amidst our world of stability, rootedness, familiarity, sameness, we experience a strange kind of restlessness inside, a longing for home in other cultures, other food, uh, other languages, smell, sound. This drives me towards finding the unfamiliar as I crawl remain suspended or even rooted to this in-between space that I call the border. So in 2017, I was in Cornell University and we were visiting an apple orchard there. I was initially overwhelmed looking at the vast expanse of green, the huge varieties of apple, magnanimous storage area. Gradually, when my sense of awe subsided by a bit, I was invited to taste the apples. I hesitated because there wasn't enough room in my stomach. Very politely, I was assured that I need not eat the whole apples. I can just take a bite and throw the rest away. At that point, my eyes fell on these huge baskets which were kept at different corners in the storage area. And all those baskets were filled with half-eaten apples. A strange kind of resistance ran through my body and I couldn't bring myself to do it. I just couldn't take a bite and throw the rest of the apple away. Neither could I explain my feeling. A year later, on one summer afternoon in Kolkata, Rosalie and I were having dosa from a roadside stall. Some children who live on that street came up to us and immediately Rosalie could not respond to it. She stopped eating, she couldn't continue eating. But then she did not know what's the right thing to do, how, what is the right way to buy food for them. That immediately triggered my memory from the Cornell Apple Orchard. 
though apparently these two incidents do not have a direct connection. I have grown up being told do not waste food, take mus much, as much as you can eat on your plate, and do not waste rice. I have always wondered what's in rice. But then I realized that maybe it is the stories that I have inherited from my grandparents and elders in my family, the stories from partition, from the famine, that has shaped my relationship to food in complex ways. On the other hand, Rosalie's grandparents were survivors from the Nazi concentration camp, which is why they attach a lot of meaning to the gift of life, to food. That incidentally shapes her relationship to food, and we both suddenly, at that point, started talking about our relative situation of scarcity and abundance. Downright, it came to a full circle, and I realized that why, why I couldn't take a bite from an apple and throw the rest away, and why Rosalie was in tears when these children came up to her when she was eating. One actually doesn't need to travel very far to meet another culture. It could just be the house round the corner, the next neighborhood, the street next to our houses. I went to a performance walk with my students at night to see how the city lives at night. The only prompt that we had given each other was that we could experience the city in our personal ways through our senses, which meant that we could take photographs, make notes, sketches, record sounds, talk to people if we wanted to. So at 2.30 a.m., we were walking down Central Avenue, which is one of the largest, biggest, oldest streets of Kolkata. And on a bend uh, that hides in that magnanimous road, I saw a bunch of kids playing cricket at 2.30 a.m. in the night. I did not want to interrupt their intense match, but I couldn't hold my curiosity back. So I asked one of them that, why are you playing at this weird hour in the night? Visibly, that child was amused with my question. He looked at me and said, Amra to rate hi We play at night with an equal measure of naivety. I said, oh, why at night? He looked at me and said, because we have to work during the day, and there is no place in the city to play. So when everyone sleeps, so many children wake up and claim their spaces in our city at night. Probably I sleep in the safety of my home. That night I felt like a tourist in my own city. Actually, borders aren't that obvious as they are made to look like. So Rosalie and I went to this small border town in Malda along the Indo-Bangladesh border to present one of our performances. We reached at 4 a.m. on a chilly winter morning, and Shongita came to the station to receive us. She took us to the college campus, and we noticed that all the classrooms, the corridors, are beautifully decorated with flowers. Shongita made tea for us. She made sure that there were blankets in our room, that the heaters were running. She showed us around the village, filled us in with stories from the world border, served us lunch, organized our lecture demonstration, provided us with all the props that we needed for our performance. And since then, since 4 a.m. in the morning, I saw her walking tirelessly. During our performance, there's a moment in which I have to unwrap my sari. And when I was about to do that act, both Rosalie and I felt a certain kind of apprehension on stage. Several questions ran through my body and mind. Was I about to perform a transgressive act in the context of an orthodox religious culture? I was looking around because somehow I wanted to share a glance with Shongita for assurance, but I couldn't spot her in the audience. The first few rows were all filled by very formal, reserved men. So we continued with our performance. Towards the end of it, there's a joyous sequence of dance in which we gift each other flowers. So Rosalie and I spontaneously wanted to invite Shongita on stage, the only woman professor whom we had met at that college. We invited Shongita on stage. She came on stage, drank in the performative energy, held our hands, and while trembling, 
but with a certain kind of firmness. She said, how across the world women share their experiences. She demanded that a copy of Simon de Beauvoir's The Second Sex be provided in the college's library uncensored. Something inside me shifted, quietly. She had wept and shared that she can meet her child only once, who lives in the next village, that she is never invited for academic or administrative meetings, but is always burdened with organizational work, that she may never get to do the job for which she has studied and trained. And as Shongita was sharing this, she was convinced that I can closely relate to her reality, but ironically, I felt like an outsider. I felt very foreign to that reality, to the hugely different lives that women live in the same professional field, but just a few hours away from my city. Ironically, even the young men folk at, the, at that college was referring to me as the foreign man, because I was with Rosalie, but who knows what that foreignness felt like that evening. We are all at a moment of a sudden pause, of coping with an inability to save lives, of helplessly witnessing lives being disposed, of fiercely guarding what I call family, of an unbearable fear of losing human touch in times of pain and joy. A few years back, when Rosalie was visiting Kolkata, we went to a salon that I am familiar with. When we were inside that salon, Rosalie had said just in the passing that uh, she's under the weather and she has a headache. Immediately, the lady who owns that salon asked her to relax and applied lavender oil on her forehead and nostrils. I could see that Rosalie is overcome with emotions. There were tears in her eyes and she could not, she could not express herself. Later, she told me that she can't imagine that somebody would touch her when she has said that she has a cold. I did understand that the kindness of that gesture has touched her, but I could not totally grasp what the power of touch could have meant for her. Now that the narrative of touch is transforming all around us, and we are witnessing inhumane attitudes around sick bodies, migrant bodies, laboring bodies, I slowly understand what the meaning of touch is. In many Western cultures, there, there is a fear around contagion that already existed, which could have stemmed because of the Spanish flu, of the influenza, but close proximity with strangers is deemed to be dangerous in public spaces. Caregiving does not necessarily translate into being physically present with that person. So how a very simple act of touching can comfort and shelter a person makes more meaning to me now that we are losing human touch in every sense of the word. There's always a bridge over troubled waters that takes us to the other. For me, working through difference is an act of surrender, of embracing the other. The simple act of wanting to listen to the one who is not like me, who doesn't dress like me, doesn't eat like me, doesn't pray like me, that helps me shed off toxic biases. For me, these ironic and poetic conflicts between obstacles and bridges, between longing and separation, is the inspiration for my life and thereby for making art. Thank you. <laughs>